following a plot, I have no choice but to trust that sense, reliable or not. I often feel like I have nothing to say about poetry and then I hear myself talking. I have nothing to say, Mary Ruffle writes in Madness, Rack and Honey, as she tries to dream up a lecture. Yet I know that before long, I will sound like I'm on a crusade. To borrow another slightly modified sentence from Heaney, professors of poetry, apologists for it, practitioners of it from Philip Sidney to Seamus Heaney, all sooner or later are tempted to show how poetry's existence as a form of art relates to our existence as citizens of society, how it is of, quote, present use. I'm sorely tempted myself. Poetry, like everything else that I care about, sometimes feels like it needs defending, especially these days. Philosophers from Plato to Soren Kierkegaard to Theodore Adorno have all thrown shade at poets and poetry. For Plato, poets confused read reason. For Kierkegaard, they made too much noise. For Adorno, poetry was another one of the barbarisms, which to be fair, included just about everything in his mind. And I can't really argue because I think they are right, at least in a limited contingent sense, which is the sense of most poetry and most clear thinking. For poetry makes nothing happen, as Auden says. It survives, Auden says, a way of happening, a mouth. Here's the thing, to bring it around more directly to the topic of this lecture. There's no such thing as an aesthetic death mudslide. That's very important. Don't forget it. Another thing. Poets will say anything if it sounds cool. <laughs> Consider the phrase aesthetic death mudslide. <laughs> or consider this from Wallace Stevens, the insurance executive par excellence of so-called modernist poetry. This is his poem. Call the roller of big cigars, the muscular one, and bid him whip in kitchen cups, concupiscent curds. Let the wenches dawdle in such dress as they are used to wear, and let the boys bring flowers in last month's newspapers. Let be be finale of seam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. In graduate school, a professor wrote on a poem I'd submitted for workshop, quote, you are the emperor of ice cream. <laughs> which I have to admit is the kind of reference part put down, part praise that only a cool mind makes. I also admit I did not get the reference. <laughs> the Emperor of Ice Cream is a weirdly sexual poem. I only quoted the first stanza. The second stanza has three glass knobs, fan tails and horny feet. Let the lamp affix its beam, Stevens declares, which sometimes sounds phallic to me. Like sex and sexuality, the poem rewards interpretation to the same degree that it resists a definitive meaning. Which is why, as a friend put it, it's a great thing to tell someone. They'll think about it all their life. And tell it to somebody in a public lecture. Of course, Wall Stevens gave us one of the definitive cool minds of the previous century in his poem, Snowman, which begins, one must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter. It's a challenge to quote only part of the poem since it's one long sentence with snaking deceptive syntax organized in tercets. Let's skip to the end nonetheless to hear the emperor without his clothes. This is the last uh, stanza. For the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. It's exquisite nonsense. 
the existential modernist insurance policy. I took one out myself years ago. Pure Lao Tzu. It's also pure Wallace Stevens. The snowman and the emperor both mean many things, but nothing definitively, which could also read nothing, comma, definitively, which is comma, very cool. If it sounds like I'm poking fun at Stevens, I am. In my family, it's a form of affection. It also happens that I've carried these poems in my own poetic atmosphere for so long that I've been shaped by the natural resources we shared. My grassland of earthly delights includes many species of paradoxes. Playing with Stevens is a way to not take myself too seriously. It's also how the ecology of my mind functions. Remember, there's no such thing as an aesthetic death mudslide. I actually wrote drink water over this. So. If you see me do it, I'm just following instruction. <laughs> um, poetry makes nothing happen, goes Auden's line. In the specific instance of the elegy for William Butler Yeats, who died in 1939 and lived through the First World War, the Irish War of Independence, and the Irish Civil War, the political sense of that line is clear and, yes, nihilistic. Poetry won't change the course of political history. Yeats wasn't really a political poet, though. He was a moral poet, and so was Auden. Auden's elegy for Yeats begins, after all, with the climate, and it is a cool one, cold even. This is how it begins. He disappeared in the dead of winter. The brooks were frozen, the airports almost deserted and snow disfigured the public statues. The mercury sank in the mouth of the dying day. What instruments we have agree, the day of his death was a dark, cold day. The mercury sank in the mouth of the dying day, and poetry is a way of happening, a mouth. In the moral sense, the nothing that poetry makes happen has a positive force one that works through language, speech, and rhythm, and that evokes poetry's spiritual, contemplative, and magical origins. By magic, I mean charms, spells, incantations. Human reason is beautiful and invincible, Shesla Miwosh begins his simultaneously devastating and hopeful poem, Incantation. Miwosh came of age in World War II Poland as part of the Polish resistance to the Nazi occupation, he defected from the communist bloc after the war. He wrote Incantation in Berkeley, California in 1968. What's important to remember about an incantation is that it's a summoning into being, an invitation to something from outside our world to join our world. Miwosh is summoning a beautiful and invincible human reason because such a reason doesn't exist yet in this realm. It's a nothing that perhaps on some level poetry can make happen. The poem ends like this. Beautiful and very young are philosophia and poetry, her ally in the service of the good. As late as yesterday, nature celebrated their birth. The news was brought to the mountains by a unicorn and an echo. Their friendship will be glorious. Their time has no limit. Their enemies have delivered themselves to destruction. In The Noble Rider and The Sound of Words, Wallace Stevens claims that the nobility of poetry is a violence within protecting us from a violence without. Much depends, like the red wheelbarrow, on hearing the double meaning of without, i.e. the violence that comes from outside and the violence we face in the absence of poetry. From Chris Nealon's poem essay, The Victorious Ones. And yes, like every other poet with a child, I have dreamed of mine along some empty road in camouflage and tatters, scrambling for potable water in 2046. But you know what? Fuck the zombie apocalypse. I'm going to imagine him with comrades. Poetry, shame as he says, is the imagination pressing back against the pressure of reality. We're getting to the climate part.
In Xanadu, did Kublai Khan a stately heat dome decree was the runner up secret alternate title for this lecture, but it doesn't work metrically. It's also a reference that requires knowledge of Samuel Taylor Coleridge poem, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge poem, or at least Citizen Kane. I don't know how available that knowledge is anymore. In the winter of 1996 on Vancouver Island in a literature 12 classroom in our high school in the trees, Mr. Thompson had our small class draw a large picture of Coleridge's poem, which includes, as it happens, a sacred river and a waning moon. I thought about that drawing on the hottest day of the heat dome in 2021, as I swam in Okanagan Lake at 9 a.m. before it grew too painful to be outside. My family and I were at a little public access beach in the mission with a small grassy area, pleasantly shaded by several large trees. Before swimming, while we were sitting under the trees, my unexpected under the circumstances happiness put me in mind of a different poem by Coleridge called This Lime Tree Bower, My Prison. In that poem, he laments, and this is a thing that happens to you if you read a lot of poems, every, you're like sitting under a tree and you're like, oh yeah, there's a Coleridge poem, which you can't share with anybody because nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but in that poem, he laments what's been lost, but also notes that sometimes tis well to be bereft of promised good that we may lift the soul and contemplate with lively joy, the joys we cannot share. But when I swam out into the lake and looked back at the large stone mansion next to the park with its infinity pool and tennis courts and security system, it was Kublai Khan's stately pleasure dome that visited me. This is from his poem. A miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice goes to the poem, but also Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesizing war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves. Coleridge's poem is subtitled, Or a Vision in a Dream, a Fragment. It's probably just as famous for the story of its composition, which came to Coleridge in an opium dream. As Coleridge told it, he was partway through recording the poem when, from his dream when he was interrupted by the infamous person from Porlock. So that we have, so what we have are about half the lines from, that Coleridge received in his reverie. The person from Porlock went on to have walk-on bits and works from everyone from Arthur Conan Doyle to Vladimir Nabokov to Neil Gaiman, which is evidence that a career in literature, like everything else, is about timing. When it comes to longevity in literature, being in the right place at the right time and the wrong place at the wrong time amount to the same thing. Keep the heart awake to love and beauty, Coleridge writes. That's a good idea. I was happy that morning of the heat dome with my family swimming in the lake next to an infinity pool and sitting under the trees. I was terrified and I was happy. Infinity is when it goes on forever, but an infinity pool is the illusion that it goes on forever. Sometimes the illusion tells the greatest truth. What actually goes on forever? Well, nothing. Atmospheric rivers are long, narrow bounds of water flying through the air. That's my technical description. Unlike terrestrial rivers, what we call in my house, river rivers, the channel an atmospheric river flows through is defined by altitude rather than width. In other words, atmospheric rivers can bring rain to a wide region while still being narrow. It's also a familiar phenomenon. When I was a kid in the 1980s on Vancouver Island, we called it the Pineapple Express, which evoked for me an aesthetic of fruit and ukuleles on a train an atmospheric river by any other name as someone once mused. Water flying through air is generally quite familiar. We call that kind of water clouds. Familiar things change though. A once familiar river may also meet with changed lands, fires, levees, industrially modified mountains and valleys. Change, as they say, can be difficult. Make it new, they said. 
make it end you, I say. If you can never step into the same river, river twice, you can never dance under the same atmospheric river. Remember, there's no such thing as an aesthetic death mudslide. I'm serious about that. That's a solemn thing. That the term atmospheric river entered the popular discourse in this province has, I suspect, in part to do with the fantastical image of a river in the sky. This image is powerful enough to be in some way commensurate with the power we've experienced recently. Also, it sounds cool. It happens to be trochaic trimeter to get technical. Six syllables, three feet, stress on the first syllable of each foot. Hail to thee, blithe spirit. That's Percy Bysshe Shelley. Atmospheric river. That's the weather network. Also, the weather network is a fantastic metaphor. I wish I'd thought of it. It's well known that we have a bad habit in this culture of witnessing power almost strictly in its destructive forms. By witnessing, I mean paying attention. For example, the general mind-boggling power of plants to transform energy from outer space into unbelievable varieties of shapes and colors goes largely unremarked on. We literally live on solar power. Keep the heart awake indeed. We're suddenly paying attention to flying rivers because we recently encountered a few really intense ones that we were not prepared for and our lack of preparation was catastrophic. That's the other thing about the familiar. It can become invisible. It becomes easy to forget about. Think of all those solar panels in your vegetable crisper. They become a nothing that is there. In a different context, another word for atmosphere is mood. Rain is very moody. A river is a mood. Another word for mood is vibe. Nothing has more mood, more atmosphere, more vibe than the moon. Nothing with all its reflected light is more cool. Yes, comma, nothing. Mary Riffle is convinced that the first lyric poem was written at night and that, quote, the moon was witness to the event and that the event was witness to the moon. She pinpoints the emergence of lyric poetry to Sappho in the sixth century BC under a full or nearly full moon. I've heard of writing instructors who outlaw images of the moon in their students' poetry. It's too familiar as my friend Daniel Scott Tisdell would put it. What he means is it's a cliche. It's not cool anymore. It's not just that in an image repeated ad nauseum over millennia may lose its cool, so to speak, that it can become familiarly invisible, but its ready-made poeticism can be both an unexamined shortcut for poets and a source of heavy interference for a reader. The moon has baggage. For the novice poet, that baggage can give the impression that you're going somewhere. Put the moon in your poem and immediately you are bathed in the light of Louis Vuitton or more likely Samsonite. But where are you going exactly? Our friend Ashley Little, who is here, introduced me to a writing exercise I often use with students in first year. The exercise is simple, write 100 similes for the moon. Maybe it's a common exercise. I don't know, I didn't ask Ashley and I didn't Google it. Uh, <laughs> but it's a good exercise. Typically, I invite students to compare their lists and to note which similes are identical or nearly identical to the ones on other people's lists, i.e. which ones are handed down culturally inculcated ways of looking at the moon and which ones appear to be their own. For who has ever seen the moon rising in the evening sky or hanging over the west in the morning and thought, that is too familiar, that is a cliche. Originally, I was going to have my daughter come up about now and play Moon River on the accordion, but they're going to see Tyler, the creator, tomorrow in Vancouver, so they're leaving very early. Uh, 
but uh, who knows another time because now I'm going to talk about Moon River. Moon River is a song made famous by Audrey Hepburn in the 1961 film Breakfast at Tiffany's. Her character Holly Golightly sings it on the fire escape. It's funny how the name Golightly and the image of the fire escape read differently 60 years later in a climate of heat domes and atmospheric rivers. Breakfast at Tiffany's is a film known for its style, its atmosphere. Hepburn's little black dress at the start of the film, her Oliver Goldsmith sunglasses, an oversized cigarette holder are all iconic images of American cinema. They are moons, endlessly repeated, forever in style. And of course, the Henry Mancini and Johnny Mercer tune, Moon River, all major key and apostrophe and umpteen renditions. The song is addressed to the moon, or at least the river of the moon, if I'm to believe the grammar. Here's the first verse. Moon river, wider than a mile. I'm crossing you in style someday. Oh, dream maker, you heartbreaker. Wherever you're going, I'm going your way. It's a nifty bit of rhyming, actually, with all kinds of repeated sounds. Formerly, my favorite bit is the second line where mile gets a rhyme with style, but the line doesn't end there. Instead, the major chord gives way to a minor chord and the adverbial qualifier, some, qualifier someday with heavy emphasis, emphasis on day. It's some day that sets up the verse's resolving rhyme, I'm going your way. The second and final verse has the Moon River, Dream Maker, Heartbreaker character and the singer off to see the world. There's a rainbow, a bend, a huckleberry friend. The huckleberry friend is the Moon River, I think. How the Moon River has a huckleberry quality, I don't really know. Some huckleberries are pink, some are purplish, some are huckleberry fin. A curious thing about the novel Huckleberry Finn is that it's told by someone who doesn't know how to read. As my partner pointed out, rivers and huckleberries are probably friends. Moon rivers, atmospheric rivers, river rivers, and all the kinds of huckleberries. The huckleberries grow here, Nancy. Like in the higher in the mountains? Yeah. I grew up on Vancouver Island where all the huckleberries are pink, and then I lived in Oregon and all the huckleberries were blue. So I had no idea. So that's the first part of the title of this lecture, Atmospheric Moon River. It's a vibe. I'm not sure what it means, but I believe it is meaningful. That is my basic poetic stance, agnostic on a meaning, faithful to meaning. Meaning is something that arises within a set. It's emergent. It's a story. It can be attributed to words and images only to the degree that those things are in relation to other stories of meaning in one's life. In my poems, I try to create structures of resonance in which meaning might be heard. That's the core of my poetics. We might call it an atmosphere or a climate. The term poetics has several interrelated uses. In one sense, poetics is the name for the branch of literary criticism devoted to the study of poetry. In another sense, poetics refers to the implicit and explicit compositional principles to which a poet subscribes. A third sense has to do with, quote, any formal or informal survey of the structures, devices, and norms that enable a discourse, genre, or cultural system to produce particular effects. The Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics offers the following examples, the poetics of space, the poetics of postmodernism, and even the poetics of prose. The prevailing conditions of a region of thought, we might say, its climate, the particular effects of a system the poetic ne poetics network. I have it on all the time. In one sense, climate is a synonym for mood or atmosphere. We, may say, we might say we are living in a crisis of moods. Last summer during the heat dome and wildfire smoke, I started describing the season as hot winter. Hot winter is the time of year when one doesn't want to go outside and little grows. 
this winter was the first time I preferred winter, winter to hot winter, better atmosphere. The climate is changing, we say, and we mean globally because each particular climate in a particular place is a subsystem of the global climate, of the atmosphere of the planet. Poems are like that too. They are enmeshed in a world of poetry that includes not only the poems of language, but the poems of air and gravity, of plants and animals, of minerals and water and light. For humans are not the only beings in conversation with poetry. A poetic sixth sense is like Doppler radar picking up incoming patterns and moods, making forecasts. It's about that reliable too, sorry, Seamus, and has to be constantly revised. Usually the most accurate description of the weather can be obtained by going outside. I mean that literally, also figuratively. Going outside in the cold winter rain or noonday summer sun can tell one infinitely more about the state of the atmosphere, including the weather, than reading the weather report on one's phone. For the poet, allowing one's body, one's mind, one's self to travel beyond the page, beyond language, beyond the edge of what Heaney calls the frontier of writing into communion with ineffable silence. This is where nothing happens. The Oracle doesn't know the future, but rather what is always true. The sense of poetry is contingent and I didn't share with you what Auden says to Yeats just before the line about nothing. This is what I was telling my daughter Neela this afternoon. In some ways, these are the more important lines. You were silly like us. Your gifts survived it all. The parish of rich women, physical decay, yourself. Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. In his book, Fear and Trembling, Soren Kierkegaard says, silence is the demon's trap. And the more one is silenced, the more terrible the demon. But silence is also the divinity's mutual understanding with the single individual. Poetry happens in the tension between the poet's need to resist that demon by singing and the poet's paradoxical need to commune with the divinity in order to learn the song, to be of present use and to regard the nothing that is not there and the nothing that is to reward interpretation while resisting definitive meaning. A poet will say anything if it sounds cool, if it creates a vibe, an atmosphere, because a poetic utterance is climatic. It exists in and is constitutive of a climate. The word climate, it might be interesting to note, shares a root with the words climax and clemency as well as a part as well as a term for a part of the female sexual anatomy. The only emperor, as the insurance policy states, is the emperor of ice cream. And now I think I finally see the path that I've plotted. Yet what of this news of a beautiful and invincible human reason? What of the unicorn and the echo on the mountaintop? There are many worlds, but only one earth. Worlds come and go, but the earth is the sacred circle that remains. The image of God and Adam touching fingers is the image of the sun touching the branch in the continuous rush of being. One way to think of nothingness is as a necessary condition of potential. The benefit of a cup is that it can hold water. The benefit of a poem is that it can hold meaning. But it's the emptiness of the cup. It's nothingness that is useful. I wanted to say something in this lecture about Judith Butler's notion of psychic excess, but I can't remember what. I wanted to comment on William Butler Yeats's interest in automatic writing and psychic communiques, but that's probably a different lecture. There's no such thing as an aesthetic death mudslide because death exceeds aesthetics. Poetry is a communique from the land of that excess. What captures me now, the day before my 44th birthday, about poems and poetry is the portal it opens in me to the fundamental presence. 
That presence has gone by many names, some of which I've used in this lecture, but all of which to some degree or another obscure as much as illuminate. All the ways that poems have been written, I sometimes tell students, is how poems are written, and then infinitely more ways yet unrecorded. In that there is something called poetry to which all those ways lead, any one way will do given sustained attention, playfulness, and discipline. A teacher of mine, Joe Millar, said that one of the best things about being a poet is that you don't have to be smart. And it's true. Most of us are never as smart as our poems because our best poems always exceed us on some level. So I will leave you with a poem called Atmospheric Moon River. It might not be my best, but I think it says something that I can't say any other way. First, it says I should drink water. Atmospheric Moon River. December loomed with its supply chain of moods. The plum tree's last medallions of golden leaves, its riviere of blue light emitting diodes for Diwali. In my dreams, I could do no violence. No matter how hard I tried, I had no force with which to execute my attacks. I stomped dream body after dream body, but no one was ever hurt, as if something wanted to remind me, even in my sleep, of my impotence in global affairs, as if something wanted to save me. O oh, western wind, when wilt thou blow? I listened to an sentimental mood nightly, I borrowed a distinction between porn and pornography. Mornings, the moon lowered itself over the western mountains and hung there, golden white against the sky's cool complexion. Not even looking at me, but looking at me, if you know what I mean. Tomorrow, sex will be good again is a phrase I read and repeated via text to a colleague working on affect theory in Hungary a person for whom I had indeterminate feelings. Psychic excess, they called it, quoting Judith Butler Yeats. On the other side of the mountains, a thin river of water poured like grief through the atmosphere, wiping out everything, bridges, hillsides, farmland. Only debt survived, barely. I got to thinking, how that cameo moon might look on me with my undertones of firebush and raspberry, my cobalt disbelief in money, the thin tremulous needle of futurity that fluttered in all my poetry. I was in an elevator, ascending a glass tower, the floors lighting up like cigarettes in the dark, like parts of my brain when I sang the small rain down can rain. Across the province, we gathered candles and sandbags. We prepared to lose all power. Above the building, beyond the many panels of tempered glass, a tower crane floated in the river of rain. Even then we knew abundance. Autumn's harvest of darkness, in which tiny green lights grew like mushrooms along the jib of the crane. There's no such thing as an aesthetic death mudslide. Atmospheric moon river, I'm crossing you. Thank you very much. Am I now meant to invite comments, questions, jokes? Oh, thanks, Sharon. Really splendid. I, uh, as a uh, statement of poetics at this time, um, I mean, historically, today, tonight, forever, it's splendid. Um, it's, it's one of the best things I've, I've ever heard. Um, I'm kind of Whoa. It, you know, as, as I'm speaking, I'm thinking, 
this has to be published. I mean, this this has to be other people <laughs> who are necessarily listening in tonight. Um, I was. I thought when you were uh, you sort of talking beforehand, you you hit on several of the themes that I was going to talk on. Uh, so that was very serendipitous. Oh. Last week, I was joking that tonight I was going to play the role of public in intellectual, even though I had auditioned for court jester. Mm -hmm. But I'm not funny enough. <laughs> That's really. <laughs> uh, but I was like, I had actually no idea if this made any sense. Like none. <laughs> I was. So I'm glad that you liked it. I'm glad I that it made sense to, to somebody. I, I wrote a poem a couple of weeks ago where I said, I said the line, I can't remember the exact line, but it was that the moon is present in every poem, whether mm. the moon is or not. Yes. So I really appreciate that uh, point you made about the moon being a secret creature. And, and yeah. But when you see it in the sky, it's anything else. I know. And you can't not, who's going to not comment on the moon? Like, what are you going to do? Thank you, Sharon. That's very gracious. Uh, great. <laughs> we have recorded this, so, you know, it was all good to hear something. And I felt the same as Sharon. I wanted to write something down. Yeah. I mean, you have my email. You can get this. I'd probably give it to you. It should be on the front page of every newspaper. Publish it, but you might want to say you changed the first Yeah. Maybe not. It could, be, it could be like a drinking game for... Uh, <laughs> this would have been a different lecture if I was actually drinking. <laughs> Well, thank you for your uh, attention and for everybody online. I saw lots of familiar names from all over uh, the place and that's really lovely. Um, thank you, Sharon, for like setting this example for us. I'm very pleased to be able to do it. For the people who are here, we can talk afterwards. We don't have to leave me up here. Those of us who are here, we can have food. Chat. Thanks, everyone. Uh